good afternoon students uh, in the previous uh, lecture uh, we started with uh, the tractive force now this tractive force uh, it is the force this uh, that is uh, available at the contact point of the uh, tire uh, and the road so the wheel tire uh, the drive uh, wheel tire and the road this fwl here this is the tractive force so now um, in uh, the subsequent slides we will be deriving a formula to correlate this uh, tractive force to the uh, torque that is developed by the engine te now the first step is uh, from the uh, diagram uh, this, this diagram here okay uh, now this te is the uh, torque that is developed by the engine okay. now if uh, we consider there is no slip uh, in the clutch plates okay so this means the torque developed by the engine or the engine torque will be equal to the clutch or the uh, torque converted torque or tc so tc will be equal to te because uh, after the engine there is clutch and after the clutch then there is the transmission gearbox so if there is no slip between the clutch plates of the clutch if we consider that there are no there is no slip then the value of tc uh, that is the torque uh, at the clutch will be equal to that is the output torque from the clutch will be equal to the input torque that is from the engine so te is equal to tc now if we know that uh, uh, what is the gear ratio of uh, the gear engaged that is uh, we are running the first gear or the second gear or the third gear so we have uh, the count of the number of teeth on the gear and from that we can calculate the gear ratio so if uh, the gear ratio of the transmission that is this uh, transmission here uh, or the gear box the gear ratio is ix okay. now if uh, this value is known ix is the gear ratio of the gear box and tg is the torque uh, after uh, the gearbox or the transmission is there so this is uh, your uh, te that is the torque developed by the engine and tg is the torque that is available after the gearbox so tg will be equal to the gear ratio multiplied by the input torque so it will be equal to ix multiplied by te so that will be the value of tg now this uh, torque available after the gear gearbox uh, through the propeller shaft through the propeller shaft it goes into the your differential so this tg gets converted into td and i not is the gear ratio of the differential so the propeller shaft is transmitting torque to the rear axle where it is multiplied with the final drive gear ratio that is i not and this gives the torque at the differential so td will be equal to i not into tg so td will be equal to i not into tg now this tg uh, this td sorry this uh, torque that is uh, available at the differential it gets divided into two halves so see in this diagram this differential torque td it gets it divides this torque equally into two halves that is the two axles uh, is two sides of the rear axle one goes on to the right wheel and the other half goes to the left wheel so if tlw is the torque uh, that is uh, driven or that is transferred to the left wheel and trw is the torque that is transferred to the right wheel so in this case tw will be equal to tlw will be equal to trw it will be half of td by 2 okay. so the total torque that is available at the differential it gets divided into equally into the left wheel and the right wheel when the wheels they are moving in a straight line so it gets divided so uh, into half so td by 2 is there now the sum of uh, the tlw and trw is equal to td okay now from uh, this uh, equation 
that is uh, this equation here that is tw equals to td by 2 okay this equation fourth equation that tw that is torque available at the wheel it is equal to half of the differential torque now here if you substitute the value of td so it will be equal to i not into tg okay divided by 2 and if we substitute the value of tg it will be equal to i not into ix into te divided by 2 so here what we have done we have substituted the values here that is tw is equal to td by 2 so td ki value in terms of tg and then tg ki value in terms of te substitute ki from the equations 3 and 4 and we get this final value where the torque available at the wheel is correlated to the torque available at the engine te okay so this multiplied by the differential gear ratio and uh, the your transmission gear ratio divided by 2 that gives you the torque that is available at the wheel in terms of torque generated by the engine te is there okay now the formula of the wheel torque that is 6 uh, applies to the vehicle which is driving on a straight line where the left wheel torque is equal to the right wheel torque. Now, if uh, this is only applicable if the, uh, your vehicle is running uh, in a straight line. Okay. In that case, PLW is equal to PRW equals to PW. Now, from the mechanics uh, where the torque uh, is equal to force multiplied by the perpendicular distance. Now, in this diagram here, FWL is the traction force, TWL is the torque available, okay, and RW is the radius of the wheel. So, this torque will be equal to force multiplied by the radius, perpendicular radius. So, that is there, TLW will be equal to FLW into RW, and similarly, on to the right wheel, TRW will be equal to FRW into RW. Now this uh, here, we know that TLW equals to TRW is equal to TW. So in general, we can write that TW, it is equal to FW into RW, where FW is the wheel force or the tractive force and RW is the radius of the wheel. Now from this equation, we can write the FW equals to TW upon RW. And from this uh, equation number 6, we substitute the value of TW here. So, we will get the value of FW equals to I0 into IX into TE divided by 2 RW. So, this is the final formula that we were interested in, in which the tractive force is correlated to the torque that is developed by the engine at the crankshaft and the radius of the wheel. So, if uh, we can say here, if the engine torque increases, the tractive force also increases. But if the radius of the wheel increases, the tractive force it decreases. So, there is a direct and reverse relationship between the two. Okay, after the tractive force, uh, the next topic will be uh, on what are the various resistive forces that. Uh, apply on a vehicle when the vehicle is uh, in motion okay uh, those forces uh, resistive forces are those forces that uh, resist the forward motion of the automobile are known as the resistive forces uh, the major uh, uh, resistive forces that are available uh, is uh, your uh, number one is the aerodynamic resistance force second is your rolling resistance and the third will be your gradient or uphill resistance. Okay. Now, if we talk of uh, the force, uh, uh, the Newton's, if we talk of the Newton's second law of motion, force is equals to mass into acceleration. So, okay. so this vehicle acceleration, that is dv by dt, uh, it will be given by uh, force divided by mass. Force is equal to ma, so, A will be equal to force by mass. Now, in this case, the force that is uh, acting uh, on the vehicle, uh, when the vehicle is in motion, uh, it will be your thrust, uh, the your tractive force, Ft, 
that is uh, the total attractive force required to move the vehicle minus the resistance force because of the resistance. So FT, attractive force minus the resistance force. Now this resistance force uh, is the force that resists the forward motion of the vehicle. Now this resistive force is because of these three uh, reasons. One is your aerodynamic resistance, second is your rolling uh, resistance, and the third one is your the gradient resistance. Is there? Okay. Now here, uh, dv by dt is your acceleration equals to change in force, tractive force minus the resistance force divided by delta. Delta is the mass factor into m. m is the mass, total mass of the vector. Now here, mass factor uh, may vary if uh, on the diagram on the right hand side, you can see uh, that uh, the uh, delta here is different. If the car is in, uh, say, uh, on the level road, uh, mass will be given by the weight of the car will be given by mg. But if it is on a tilt at an angle, okay, then the value of uh, mass, uh, it is different. So that becomes mg sin theta alpha. So <laughs> the value of uh, delta it uh, accommodates uh, this uh, if the car is on a level road or it is on a tilted road. So that is why it is the mass factor with which it has to be multiplied depending upon its uh, inclination. So this is uh, general. So first uh, resistive force, if we study, it will be your aerodynamic resistance. Now, aerodynamic resistance is uh, the resistance that is caused by the fluid that is flowing around the vehicle. Normally, uh, if we talk of any automobile, so automobiles run on land, so air is the uh, fluid that flows around the automobile. Okay, so the main uh, compositions of this atomic aer aerodynamic resistance are first is the turbulent air flow around the vehicle body. Okay. So now <clears throat> here in this diagram, you can see there are uh, these uh, lines on top. Uh, these are uh, straight uh, boundary lines that are uh, there. And then you have uh, these uh, pockets okay, uh, at the front. That is uh, one uh, that is just in front of the car. And the other is uh, where the bonnet and uh, the windshield they meet this is the region so where when the car is moving in the forward direction okay, uh, the impact of the air is um, maximum on these two parts okay. so that is why these are high pressure points okay. and the air circulation or the air turbulence that is caused in these two areas is causes high pressure and this pushes the car in the backward direction and this acts in the opposite direction to the motion of the vehicle. Okay. So these are your high pressure points. And then at the rear of the car, what happens is when the uh, boundary layer, it uh, separates from the body of the vehicle, it causes uh, some circulating currents at the back. These circulating currents are called wakes. Now these circulating currents, what they cause is they cause vacuum pockets. So there are two regions here that cause vacuum pockets. So that is why these are low pressure uh, regions, okay? Because vacuum is being created here. Now this vacuum, what it it does is, it uh, pushes, it pulls the car in the backward direction. So here, if there is vacuum here, so it will pull the car in the backward direction. So this again, the force is acting in the opposite direction of the motion of the vehicle. So these high pressure points at the front because of the direct impact of uh, the incoming air onto the uh, frontal area. And then the low pressure region at the back because of the circulating currents, because of the separation of the boundary layer uh, of the uh, uh, medium. In this case, it is air, it takes place. So this, uh, these uh, four points are the major cause of uh, aerodynamic resistance. So that is why the first point is these regions of turbulent air flow around the vehicle body, they comprise of 85% of the aerodynamic resistance, total aerodynamic resistance. Okay. 
Second type of uh, aerodynamic resistance is caused by the friction between the air and the vehicle body. Air molecules, air particles, or vehicle body ke beech mein jo friction hai, that accounts for around 12% of the total aerodynamic resistance. Then the third uh, is because of the vehicle component resistance that is there from the radiators and air vents. So such resistance, uh, it, uh, it has 3%, uh, it uh, um, uh, corresponds to 3% of the aerodynamic, total aerodynamic resistance. Okay. So the formula for uh, aerodynamic resistance uh, is given by RA is where it is your uh, aerodynamic resistance RA. It is equal to rho upon two, half rho. Rho is your density of air. CD is the coefficient of uh, drag. Okay. And AF is the uh, circumferential or the area of the body of the vehicle or the outer surface area multiplied by V square. V is the velocity uh, with which the vehicle is moving. So this is the formula to calculate the total resistance uh, in aerodynamics. Okay. So R is equal to rho by 2 CD AF into V square. Okay. The power required to overcome this resistance Power is given by work upon time. Work can be subdivided into force into distance. Okay. So this means force into distance upon time becomes velocity. Distance upon time becomes velocity. Force will be your this aerodynamic resistance force. So this is your RA into V. So power required to overcome this uh, resistive force. Uh, so VRA will be equal to, if we substitute here the value of RA from top, so it will be equal to rho upon CD into AF into V square into V becomes VQ. So this is this final equation gives us the total power required to overcome the aerodynamic resistance RA of the vehicle if it is moving in air. Now here in this formula, uh, velocity is the velocity with which the vehicle is moving forward that can be known area of the vehicle can be known okay density of air is known two is a constant the only thing left is cd what should be the value of cd that is the coefficient of drag so drag is the uh, it is the uh, backward resistive force with which uh, the any uh, vehicle it is pulled backwards so that is drag drag is nothing but resistance to motion so coefficient of drag so there are, uh, there, we have standard values of uh, coefficient of drag. Okay. So those values we can use. You can get the tables uh, from uh, uh, various online sources. Here I have got a, uh, one of the tables here. So you can see that the various body shapes of the cars are there. So if we have an open convertible, so aerodynamic uh, coefficient of uh, aerodynamic resistance, that is CD values given. So the value of CD varies from 0 0.5 to 0 0.7 for a van body the again value is 0.5 to 0.7 for a ponton body like this one here which has sharp edges will have 0.4 to 0.55 uh, then is your wedge shaped body <coughs> with headlamps and bumpers are integrated into the body okay so where value reduces to 0.3 to 0.4 if we have this uh, shape of a body uh, which is uh, covered wheels also, headlamps and all wheels of the body are covered. So in that case, the value becomes 0.2 to 0.25. So if it is A-shaped, it is 0.23. If it is optimum streamlined design, the value is 0.15 to 0.2. So the value of CD for trucks and road trains is 0.8 to 1.5. For buses, it is 0.6 to 0.7. For streamlined buses, 0.3 to 0.4 and motorcycles 0.6 to 0.7. So these are the standard values of a coefficient of drag CD. So from these tables, we can directly put in the value of CD depending upon what type of body of the car or a bus or vehicle or, or your uh, motorcycle is. So you can put the value of CD and you calculate and you will get the power required uh, to overcome this aerodynamic drag force. 
Now, next type of uh, resistive force is your rolling resistance. Now, rolling resistance, uh, this is an example of a, uh, say there is this uh, road here, and on top there is a, a circular wheel. So this wheel is moving in forward direction. <clears throat> now, when the wheel moves in the forward, forward direction, this is a solid wheel here. Now, in the case of rubber wheel, when the rubber wheel uh, starts to move in the forward direction, there is some deformation of the rubber that takes place. Okay. So that uh, because it is at a static position, rest position, when the car is pushed in the forward direction, there is some deformation of the tire or the rubber that takes place. Now, this resistance from the tire deformation, it uh, corresponds to 90% of this rolling resistance. Okay. Then tire penetration and surface compression. Now this tire, when it is uh, sitting on the road, the rubber, it penetrates into the grooves of the uh, road also. So that tire penetration uh, corresponds to 4% of the rolling resistance. And then the third uh, type is your tire slippage. So there can be some kind of a slip uh, between the tire and the road. Uh, so that resistance uh, corresponds to 6% of the total rolling resistance. Now, rolling resistance of a vehicle, it is proportional to the uh, weight. Okay. Uh, so this R, 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 R is your rolling resistance. Okay. So this uh, rolling resistance uh, force is directly proportional to the mg, that is the weight of the vehicle. Okay. So if we uh, get rid of this uh, proportionality sign, we get a constant. So this force of rolling resistance is equal to, this is the coefficient of rolling resistance. CRR is the coefficient of rolling resistance into mg. There. Now power required to overcome this RA, again we'll use power is equal to work upon time, force into distance upon time, or it will be force of rolling resistance into velocity. Distance upon time is velocity. If we substitute the value of RRR from top, the equation becomes coefficient of rolling resistance into m into v into g. Okay. So g is uh, uh, 9.81 and divided by 3600, it becomes watts. Okay. So PRR is in terms of uh, kilowatts. Okay. Uh, so this becomes equals to 2 points if, if you uh, calculate this. Uh, evaluate this 9.81 divided by 3600, it becomes 2.72 into 10 raised to the power minus 3 into CRR into M into V. This uh, value is in terms of kilowatts. Okay. Now, rolling resistance, uh, the coefficient of rolling resistance, uh, it is a function of tire material, tire structure, the temperature of the tire, the pressure or the inflation pressure inside the tire. Okay. Uh, the tread geometry, road roughness, the road material, and the presence uh, or absence of liquids on the road. So, if liquid is uh, on the road, if the liquid is there, so friction will be less. If uh, there is no liquid, friction will be more. So, this CRR, it depends upon all these parameters. Again, there are some uh, standard values of uh, coefficient of uh, rolling resistance that can be seen in this table. Now, if the car tire on a smooth tarmac road is there, then the value of CRR is 0 0.01. Car tire on concrete road is 0 0.011. Car tire on rolled gravel road is 0 0.02. On dark macadam road, it is 0 0.025. Unpaved road is 0 0.05 bad earth tracks 0.16, loose sand 0.15 to 0.3, <coughs> truck tire on concrete or asphalt road, truck tires, they have a CRR value of 0 0.0062, 0 0.01, wheel on iron rail for uh, trains, the value of CRR is 0 0.0012, 0 0.002. So these are the standard values of CRR. Uh, we can take the standard value and put this in this equation and you will get the total power required to overcome the rolling resistance RR. So this is about your rolling resistance. Uh, then comes is your gradient or 
अपहिल रेजिस्टेंस सो वेन द कार इज क्लाइंबिंग अपहिल तो वट विल बी दी रेजिस्टेंस फोर्स दैट द कार और वेहीकल विल फील ओके नाउ दिस ग्रेडियंट और अपहिल resistance it is composed of uh, the gravitational force acting on the vehicle and the component parallel uh, to the roadway so there is a resistance component that is uh, parallel to the roadway that is rg in this case so one is your gravitational force okay g is acting on the vehicle and the second will be your rg that is the component of the weight that is parallel to the road now this rg in this case if w is the uh, perpendicular weight okay and theta g is the angle of inclination then rg that is parallel to the road that component of weight it will be given by w g sin theta g now for small angles this value of sin theta becomes equal to tan theta so rg can be written as w tan theta g so here tan theta g if we take tan theta g equals to g capital g then rg becomes equal to w into g where g is tan theta g so where g is also known as the gradient or vertical rise per horizontal distance journey specified as percentage so g is your gradient factor okay now this is uh, the force that is acting on the uh, vehicle when it is climbing up the so it will be equal to w into tan theta g so this is your uh, third type of uh, vehicle resistance or resistive force that is the gradient or uphill resistance okay after the various resistive forces on the vehicle uh, we can uh, go on to the next uh, is uh, the power losses in automobiles now in this uh, section you can see that uh, this is uh, the uh, layout of the automobile okay now in this case uh, the 100% energy is being developed by the engine okay so from the engine uh, to the crankshaft okay uh, there will be some losses and those losses they correspond to 62% of losses so from the uh, you can see that uh, from the combustion chamber where uh, the total power is being produced and that uh, 62% of that power gets wasted and the remaining 38% uh, only reaches the crankshaft so this means that lot of uh, energy gets lost between in between the engine only from the combustion chamber to the crankshaft 62% of the energy gets lost okay this is because of engine friction engine pumping losses and the heat loss to the environment another 17% of that energy is lost to idling okay so when uh, the uh, uh, engine is running on uh, say idle okay the, we are not running the vehicle the engine is running uh, uh, is on but we are on the neutral so idling or uh, uh, another 2% uh, loss uh, is to the accessories of which so various accessories that are there in the automobile okay so they consume like your lights uh, your uh, uh, your electrical accessories like your power windows are there okay? uh, so fans are there uh, your uh, uh, blower is there uh, your uh, radiator fan is there so all those accessories uh, they consume around 2% of the uh, total energy produced by the engine okay another 5.6% is uh, lost in the drive train so when from the engine 
only 18.2% of the energy is available at the transmission or the gearbox okay so rest all is wasted in terms of idling uh, in your engine into accessories then is your drive line loss is there so 18% is available at the uh, your gearbox and then out of this 18.2% 5.6% is lost in the drive train due to friction and slippage so from the transmission or the gearbox uh, through the uh, uh, this uh, your propeller shaft onto the uh, your differential only 12.6% of the total energy produced reaches the differential okay and this 12.6% is actually available or used to run the vehicle rest all of the energy produced gets lost uh, due to different reasons that we have discussed okay. only 12.6% is available uh, for running the vehicle in the power direction so here is the table that uh, illustrates uh, the various losses so engine loss uh, is 62.4% idling loss 17.2% drive line loss is 5.6% then your accessories aerodynamic uh, loss rolling resistance loss and your inertial braking losses are there so this 15% of the power is available at the drive wheels okay so if we if we uh, say we take out this 2.2% also okay so that comes out to be around 12.8 percent so that is only available uh, to run the vehicle in the forward direction okay. so a lot of uh, losses are there in the automobile from the power that is being generated at the engine and the power actually available at the wheels Okay, next uh, topic uh, is your uh, pistons and uh, piston types. Uh, in this, uh, we will be studying about uh, what is a piston, uh, what are the various parts of a piston, and uh, what are the various uh, salient features that are desired from a piston. And then uh, we will study about what are the various types of pistons that are available. Okay, uh, so if we want to define a piston, a, a disc or a cylindrical part that is tightly uh, fitted and moving within a cylinder either to compress or transform energy imparted by a fluid expanding inside the cylinder as explosive gases into a rectilinear motion rectilinear means it is a linear motion usually transformed into rotary motion at the crankshaft by means of connecting rod so this is the definition of a piston so piston kya hai it is a cylindrical part and it tightly fits inside a uh, cylinder okay uh, the main function of this piston is to uh, impart is to uh, impart or transfer the energy that is uh, developed during the explosion or uh, the combustion of uh, uh, fuel okay and uh, it has to transfer this energy to the connecting for a crankshaft the linear motion of the piston gets converted into rotary motion of the crankshaft with the help of a connecting rod in the so this is your piston and if you see the diagram here uh, at the bottom so there are three types of rings that are there there is top ring the second ring is your viper ring and then is your oil ring uh, for a four stroke engine the top uh, is known as the crown of the piston or it is also known as the piston head the space between the piston crown or the head of the piston and the first groove it is known as the top land and the space uh, between the top first groove and the second groove is known as the uh, second land and the space between uh, the uh, second groove for the viper ring and the oil rings that space is known as the third land so first second and third land is there that is the space in between uh, this space in between this is the top land this is the second land 
and this is the third land is there. Okay, so, so the space in between uh, the various grooves for uh, piston rings uh, that is known as your land is there. Uh, and then uh, from uh, the third groove, uh, that is uh, your oil groove, uh, to the bottom part, this part of the piston is known as the skirt of the piston. Okay. And inside, uh, in between, uh, that is below this uh, oil ring, uh, the there is a slot that is cut. Uh, there is a hole cut. Uh, this hole is uh, for uh, this uh, your piston pin or the guardian pin is there on this guardian pin the small end of the connecting rod is connected okay and uh, when this guardian pin is uh, uh, fitted inside this connecting rod in the piston uh, this is locked with the help of snap rings on both sides okay so that is there uh, there are some slots also cut uh, on the circumference of this uh, skirt uh, these are known as the slots on the skirt are there. Okay. So this is your uh, piston. Now various uh, piston parts. The first top uh, part of the piston is known as the crown of the piston. The crown is the top surface of the piston, uh, which is subjected to tremendous forces and heat during all engine operations. Then uh, the parts that are in between these grooves these protruding parts they are known as the ring lands okay then we have the top land uh, the second land and the third land is there then ring grooves are there these grooves are placed uh, or cut inside the piston uh, for placing the various piston rings that is your compression ring the viper ring and the oil ring now in this uh, oil groove, if you can see this diagram here, there are these holes here. One, two, three, four, five, six, these small holes are there. Now these holes are provided, these are known as the return oil return holes. So the oil that is collected or wiped by the oil ring and the viper ring, it gets collected in this, uh, uh, the oil ring grooves. Uh, and then from these holes, uh, it is pushed backwards inside the piston and from there it drips down into the uh, oil sum. And then comes is your skirt. This, this, this uh, bottom part after the oil groove, this bottom part of the piston is known as the piston skirt. The skirt of the piston is the portion which is closest to the crankshaft that helps align the piston as it moves in the cylindrical bore. And then wrist pin boss, this is your wrist pin uh, boss. It is the bore uh, that connects the small end of the connecting rod and the piston by a wrist pin. So this is your wrist pin boss in which the, uh, your gudgeon pin or the piston pin uh, in, gets inserted and the small end of the connecting rod is uh, connected at this point. Oh, so these are the various uh, piston parts and their functions. Now, what is the, what are the uh, desirable uh, functions of a piston, piston functions? The first is it should transmit the force of explosion to the crankshaft. Second is it should form a seal so that the high pressure gases during the, com in the combustion chamber does not ex escape into the crankcase. It serves as a guide and a bearing for small end of the correcting rod. So these are the various functions of a piston. Then the piston skirt has the following functions. First is its function is to form a guide suitable for absorbing the side thrust produced on account of inclination of the connecting rod. Now, when the connecting rod is uh, inclined at an angle, when it is moving up or down, so what it does is it presses the piston on one side. Okay. So the piston skirt, it acts as a guide okay, uh, that uh, absorbs the side thrust that is produced uh, because of the uh, inclination of the connecting rod. Okay. So this, this point will be clear from this diagram here. Uh, now you can see this diagram. Now, what is happening here is uh, there are two uh, strokes that are taking place. On the left hand side, that is the red uh, 
can see the power stroke is taking place during the power stroke the combustion has taken place inside the combustion chamber and this pressure is pushing the piston in the downward direction and the inclination of this connecting rod is on to the right hand side now the pressure here is very high now when it is pushed downwards there is some resistance that is uh, given by the connecting rod now this uh, resistance by the crankshaft that is given it pushes the piston on to more on to the left side so there is this uh, major thrust area that is there so this uh, piston gets pressed firmly on to this side left hand side during the power stroke so this is your major thrust uh, side of the piston now on the other hand side if you look on to the other diagram that is the yellow that is the compression stroke is taking place during the compression stroke the piston is moving from the bottom dead center towards the top dead center now the again the resistance causes this piston to press towards the right hand side of the cylinder so piston gets pressed towards the right hand side now this force is less so that is why this is known as the minor thrust load side so these the two thrust sides major thrust side and the minor thrust side they fall or they are located radially opposite to each other okay so major thrust side is because of the power stroke and minor thrust side is because of the compression stroke okay. because in both these uh, uh, strokes the angle of inclination is there between uh, the connecting rod and the piston and that presses the piston on to one side of the cylinder okay now the function of the skirt here is to smoothly transmit this thrust okay so that no damage takes place to the piston okay so it forms this skirt forms a guide second is it must be sufficient length to resist tilting of the piston so if uh, it should be so the skirt should be designed in such a way that the length is sufficiently long enough okay so that it resists the it resists the piston tilt so the piston does not tilt okay so if uh, at certain point if it tilt is much so what it, it will happen it will uh, uh, it will stuck there it will not move up and down okay third is the combustion pressure from the piston crown is transmitted to the connecting rod through the webs inside the piston so inside the piston there are various webs that are formed inside the skirt okay so the pressure it gets transmitted through those webs to the connecting rod those webs are present inside the skirt of the piston the webs also form heat path now these webs they also form uh, the heat that is produced during combustion on the piston now that heat is absorbed by the webs that are present inside the piston and uh, through the uh, gudgeon pin process uh, this uh, heat is transmitted to the uh, lubricating oil and that heat is taken away by the lubricating oil so these are the various functions of the piston skirt next is uh, your what are the desirable characteristics of a good piston the first is it should be silent in operation second is the design should be such so that the seizer does not take place seizer is where the engine seizes okay so heat dissipation uh, through the piston should be fast okay so thermal conductivity of the material of the piston should be good so that heat is dissipated uh, instantly it should offer sufficient resistance to corrosion okay so uh, cor it should be good corrosion resistant material it should have the shortest possible length uh, next is it should be lighter in weight then uh, it should have a good thermal conductivity so that it can transfer the heat uh, easily and quickly so that it can uh, so that it can resist the occurrence of detonation okay so if uh, the thermal conductivity is not uh, good so the edges of the piston they will start to glow because heat is not dissipating fast now those glow glow edges they are the cause of uh, the knocking or detonation that might take place 
third is it should have long life so these are the desirable characteristics from a piston next topic is uh, the various uh, materials uh, uh, of the piston the first is your uh, the pistons are made up of uh, cast iron the properties of the cast iron pistons are high strength good bearing characteristics uh, they have low thermal expansion they are heavier uh, than the aluminium pistons and they have low thermal conductivity as compared to the aluminium pistons second type of pistons are aluminium uh, pistons uh, uh, aluminium alloy pistons that are uh, produced by the process of casting so that is why it is aluminium cast pistons are there in this uh, the composition is uh, uh, besides uh, the major part is aluminium the other constituents are silicon is 9 to 12% nickel is 1% copper is 1% and magnesium is 1% these pistons are lighter in weight they are economical they are for general use and but they are brittle in nature third type of uh, is your material is uh, hyper eutectic pistons uh, they have uh, again these are made up of aluminium aluminium is uh, the major component again casting is done but in this case uh, the percentage composition of silicon is great uh, it has 18 to 24% of silicon nickel is 1% copper 1% and magnesium is 1% they are cast aluminium uh, they have high silicon content 25% they are lighter in weight than normal cast piston alloy, uh, aluminium pistons they have high performance less brittle in nature they have more scuffling resistance now scuffling resistance is your uh, uh, scuffling is uh, of a material is associated with uh, adhesive wear uh, where one uh, metal when it uh, uh, rubs over the other metal uh, so due to that rubbing uh, the adhesion takes place between the two materials okay. so if uh, the materials are uh, uh, they are rough and they don't have uh, good uh, uh, say uh, they, they don't have uh, less friction so then adhesive uh, adhesiveness is great and scuffling takes place okay so if uh, because of the presence of silicon greater amount of silicon in this uh, uh, casting so this silicon provides uh, good uh, uh, friction resistance okay so that is why these type of uh, pistons they are more uh, uh, scuff uh, scuffling resistant okay but these uh, pistons they are expensive than cast pistons then comes another type of uh, aluminium piston is where they are forged okay now these uh, again the composition is the same as of aluminium cast piston silicon is 9 to 12% nickel is 1% copper is 1% magnesium is 1% but the only uh, difference is the these pistons they are drop forged or they are made because of the this forging process not the casting process okay so these are lighter in weight than the normal cast pistons stronger than normal cast piston due to less porosity so they have they are less porous inside so they have good thermal conductivity they approximately run 20% cooler than the cast piston so because thermal conductivity is more so heat dissipation is more so that is why they run at 20% cooler than the normal cast pistons so these are the four types of materials of which pistons are made then is uh, depending upon uh, the shape of the uh, head of the piston the pistons might have a flat head piston they have a dome shape and then they have a recessed shape in which uh, Uh, there is some uh, it is deeper from the middle okay so it is recessed so generally low cost uh, low performance engines they have flat head these flat head uh, pistons are associated with low cost low performance engines the pistons used uh, in some high power uh, engines may have raised dome that is the second type which increases the compression ratio so this shape is made to increase the compression ratio as well as you can control the uh, combustion using these type of pistons third is your uh, recessed head uh, in some engines pistons may be specially dished uh, 
to form the desired shape of the combustion chamber. So these are specially designed pistons. That is the recessed head pistons are there. This uh, we have covered the uh, major thrust and minor thrust is here. Next uh, is what is piston slap? Okay, <laughs> the piston slap uh, is uh, so when uh, the connecting rod is tilted or when the piston is moving up and down, okay, uh, and there is uh, clearance, uh, excessive clearance between the piston and the cylinder because of wear. So what happens is when the, uh, see here when the piston is moving. Uh, in the downward direction, so it is rotating in clockwise direction. It is moving in the downward direction. Uh, the left top corner of the piston it touches the left side of the wall, and bottom uh, right corner of the piston, that is the skirt part, it touches the right side of the piston. So when the piston uh, is at the top dead center and it suddenly moves downwards, okay, so that uh, the bottom skirt of uh, this piston it uh, uh, hits uh, the piston uh, cylinder and a sound of uh, like a slap it comes uh, if there is excessive clearance uh, between the piston and the cylinder so this slapping uh, it causes uh, the uh, material uh, to wear uh, from the cylinder uh, lining and from the skirt part of the uh, piston also so here on the diagrams on the right hand side you can see that there is a wear that has taken place on the skirt of the piston and then uh, the cylinder uh, inside uh, again there is this wear that has taken place so this wear because of this piston slap um, takes place and uh, if uh, excessive wear takes place uh, then the leakage of uh, the combustible gases uh, can take place uh, from the combustion chamber into the uh, your uh, oil sump. So pincer slab, uh, slab is a sound made when the skirt of the piston, it contacts the wall of the cylinder as the piston pivots slightly in its upward or downward motion. So in both uh, the say when the piston moves in the downward direction, this slab uh, takes place. So if it is in the power stroke, this slab will be more uh, rigorous. Okay. Uh, again, in the compression stroke also, uh, it slides uh, along the uh, cylinder and causes the cylinder lining uh, to wear out. This is your piston slab. 